Oh, glory. Yeah. Often. Pray over my news week. No. Okay, what I, this is going to be a, a, either a two or a three week thing, and the Lord knows because sometimes I can tell pretty clearly how long it's going to take to present something, and sometimes you just aren't sure. And a pastor has done that on occasion. No, I'm going to make one week. Ah, no, it's going to be, I say, oh, it's going to be one week. No, it's going to be six months. Oh, okay. You know, so we won't have quite that bad of a thing, but, but we do want to talk about a, a, a term that, that uh, I was motivated to teach about just because you hear so much garbage and so much misinformation about this term, and yet it's a very important term, and that's the term repentance, okay? Um, two different words, and I give you the, the if you want to you know, become, think of yourself a scholar or something, I give you the Greek and the Hebrew, um, and they run together. The New Testament term, metanoia. Noia is your understanding, your mind. Meta speaks of a change or an expansion. You know, we have metastatic cancer. It used to be one place, now it's spreading out. That's what that word has that idea. And then the Old Testament, the, the word has the idea of turn or turn back or return. And both of those get translated as repentance in our English versions, repentance, or the verb is repent, and, and other related words. And again, the problem today is how to use words. And, and nothing in Christianity or in the church is immune from the society that we're living in. You know, we're like a crouton buried in a big bowl of broth. You know, where the broth kind of seeps in if we're not careful. And we taste like the broth. So, and, and unfortunately, that, that, that includes getting into church circles. Uh, I hear many, too many preachers, one is too many, I guess, they say it means to change your mind. You could extrapolate that as being correct. The problem is that how we use that expression today, right? Are you going to do it? Not change my mind. You're going to buy this dress? Not change my mind. And we're, we're changing mindset. That means, well, you know, I'm, you know, I'm reconsidering. I, you know, I'll just kind of. And it's not a very significant word. It's not a very freighted, weighted word. You know, uh, you know, they say that it was the, the ladies had the privilege of changing their minds. Well, that's not got anything to do with repentance. That just got to do with I'm thinking one way. I'm going to change my thinking in some little area. I'm going to get a green dress instead of a blue dress. Yes, that is a change in your thinking, but it's not repentance. Yeah, okay. okay, so repentance is is uh, closer to a transformation of mind. And the other thing is, the Bible just simply will use the word repentance, and the Bible doesn't stop and break down each time it uses the word and say, "Well, in this case, this word means this. In this case, it means." You have to look. Context has to tell us. So there are actually a number of ways the Bible talks about repentance. And we tend, if we're not careful, to think of, that they're all the same. Every time we read repentance, it means exactly the same thing. And it doesn't. Okay, all the meanings that, that you find in Scripture relate to the basic meaning, but context, you know, like they say in real estate. Right? What's important in real estate? Location, location, and location. We'll talk to Abby, and she'll tell you about that. <laughs> and and, and in, in the Bible, when we understand words, it's, it's context, context, and context. Because most every word in English and in the Bible can have many meanings, or at least a range of meanings. And so for you to know what specific sense of repentance is going on, you have to look at the context. But what we'll do here in our study today is talk about the different, at least three different senses that the word can have. And you can, you know, again, by context, sort out what it is. And the reason that's concerned is that it is such an important word. You know, over and over again, when Jesus was preaching, what did he say? Repent and believe the gospel. John says, I'm, I'm doing a, John the Baptist, I'm doing a baptism unto repentance. It is a word that appears critically centrally 
in the gospel message. Okay? Um, oh, look at that. Uh, the March Hill. Huh? Hmm. Maybe there was a Walmart there. That's what they called it, March Hill. I don't know. Hey, Mars Hill. He said, God called her word meant to repent. So, you have Jesus, have Paul, John the Baptist. In, in, in all the main um, teaching of the gospel, we find this word repent as being central. You know, so getting a handle on what it means helps us get a handle on what these guys are saying. Sure. Yeah? Say, I believe Jesus. That's great. I know a whole lot of people believe Jesus have no idea what he's saying. Hmm? Yeah. I believe the Bible, but they don't know the Bible. And unfortunately, <laughs> Baptists are regarded as some of the worst. Yeah, you don't, may not know this, but there are certain cults that, in their training, prioritize looking for Baptists. Because they have a great deal of respect for the Bible, but they don't know what it means. So they can take a few passages, twist them out of their context, and convince them that they're teaching something that's biblical. So it is an important, important term. So how can we get to a definition? We want to say this is a definition. And uh, for me, the key verse is found in 1 Thessalonians. If you're man you remember some months ago, I don't know how long ago it was, I talked about the basics of salvation. We looked at 1 Corinthians 1, I mean from 1 Thessalonians 1. And right here at the end of this verse, as Paul's talking about the change that came over them, he says, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Now you notice right away you can see how it incorporates that Old Testament idea of Turn or return. Okay? And again, as I say, you know, if you read the Old Testament, sometimes you'll find the word repent. It's normally a translation of the word to turn or return. That's, that, that, that is what the Old Testament uses as a term for repentance. So, wait, a change, for, so we've got a change in direction. Okay, it says you turn. So, in other words, you can't turn. You've got to be heading in one direction. The turn. You know, when it says turn, there's got to be a change in direction, orientation, focus, and in action. Because you notice this is, says to serve. So you turned in order to serve. So we're, we have a change, not just in my mental attitude, but my action. Okay? And that, that's Paul's talk about repentance. Okay? Okay? Um, and it's interesting, he talks about you turn to God from idols, and we say, well, we don't have idols anymore. We got so many idols. Yeah, maybe more. I mean, we got V8 idols. Mm -hmm. You know? Or you got, you know, I got, a, I got an Apple phone, so I got an Apple News, whether I want it or not. And the number of articles on handbags, and how many thousand dollars they cost, and, you know? You could be a Birkin worshiper. You know? You don't have, you know, they don't have many churches built around here yet, but there's a whole lot of people that are, you know, following the God Birkin. You know, because, because of the attention they pay to it, because of the value they ascribe to it, you know, I've got to have the snazziest this or that or the other thing. You know, for guys, it's cars, you know. I've got to be driving my Lamborghini, right? i got a Hot Wheel, but anyway... So, so when, it, when it says turn to God from idols, it's talking about change in service, in relationship. Remember, the Bible is very clear. It says what you serve, you're the servant of. Paul said that in Romans. Okay? He said, well, you, you say I serve this, but Paul says, I'll look at what you're doing. What you serve, you, you have made yourself the servant of that thing. And here he's telling these guys, you used to be serving idols, whatever they were. And he's not specific. He's not trying to be, you know, giving them a detailed analysis because people know if they stop and reflect what it is they're serving. And if you don't know, 
Ask people around you, what do they think? You know, if, you got a, if you're married, your wife or your husband can all, you know, what are you doing? Oh, well, I, you know, a person who said he was, uh, we'll get the sinlessness, but what he said, he was, he was living a sinless life. And I said, let me talk to your wife. Yeah. You get a little different, a little different response, you know. Um, so, again, we have to stop and think. It's so easy to skip over idols, God. Okay, two words. But realize the context in which Paul is speaking. He's talking in the first century A.D., when there really were idols, there really were enormous temples, priesthoods. I mean, the lives of most of the, even these very, quote, civilized Romans and Greeks were totally dominated by these idols. You know? Um, so much so that the basic questions of morality, you know, the city of Corinth, to which he's writing this letter, had a big temple on top of, and there was a, a defensive Acropolis like the one in Athens on top of the city. I had a big temple with a thousand uh, priestesses, but they really were prostitutes. And people went in and engaged in sex with them as a religious activity. You know, that's, and that's the kind of service they were giving to this idol. Okay? Uh, so, so when he says this, it really is a little more weighty yeah. than it might be for us today. We can just skip over. It's only one verse. Goes, 10 seconds, I read it. Yeah. But for them, the word idol meant a whole lot more than it does to us. Because even when we got them, we don't think of them that way. You know, I just may have the biggest crush on this particular kind of car. But I, if I were to tell somebody, that's a, no, that's not an idol. That's just, oh, man, I just want to have a good car. Or some clothing. Or maybe I want to have a jacuzzi in my house. You know, we can create today idols because society will help us. You turn on television. You need to have this. Oh, you really ought to have that. Yeah. This is great. You know, your house will be better if you get this added. Or if you, you know, do this. Whew. You know, take this drug. You know, and it'll fix you right up. And those things can become idols. So he says, so, so this idea, it's really a transformation. It's not just, no, it's, I'm going this way. Suddenly, everything changes. I'm going that way. I'm going to actively serve God instead of what I was serving. A total disruption of my life. And in, in many countries, and Joy could probably comment on that in, in India, when a person becomes a believer, the society notices, and they're cut off from their family. I worked in, in about many years in Bangladesh. I mean, phew. Fast thing, the thing about Bangladesh and, and, and other non Christian cultures, baptism is the kicker. When you get baptized, you're cut off. It was okay until you actually publicly said, Hey, I'm followed. No, we can't have that. Your job is gone, your family is gone, whatever. So realize that this is not turning from God to idols, isn't just a small thing. He's talking about a revolution in their whole lives. And not only that, it says to serve the living and true God. So repentance is an, is an active verb. Like we say in the Bible, love is an active verb, right? God so loved the world that he gave. You know, how do we tell God to love? Because he did something. He gave his son for us. And here Paul is saying, you didn't just turn to God, you turned with an intent to serve. Okay? Repentance is an, is an active verb. It's a discernible verb. By that I mean people who are not believers can witness it. Yeah. Uh, in in, in uh, my relatively long life, I have been in, involved in a whole lot of revival meetings. But I've been involved in one revival. 
back in 1998. And it was like God says, no, it's not what you're planning. It's what I'm going to do. And he just took over Tennessee Temple University. We had a three-day meeting that went on for three weeks. The services would go on till midnight. Um, they had two uh, members of the pastoral staff in the baptistry. It was big enough to hold them. And just because they had so many people that were trying to baptize. And we're trying to get out, you know, to, and... Uh, it would impact, and it and impacted the lives of people. We had two young men from another church. Uh, I forget that, a friend who went to our church. Anyway, they came some odd night, because it was going on constantly. So Tuesday night they came, and God spoke to both of them. which are just high school teenagers. So the next night they went to their church and told their pastor that we like to, God sent them something special over there. We'd like to, can we just say a few words? Church service, that hadn't had a song service yet. Church hadn't started. So the two of these young men, not preachers, not preacher boys, just, just two young guys, got them to start sharing what God was doing. All of a sudden, people started responding. The pastor's mother, who was 80, finally admitted she'd never been saved. They had like 10 or 15 people saved that night. I mean, these are not trained. They were just sharing. And that's the, that is Amen. what happens when there's real revival. It tends to spread organically. Remember the motorcycle guy? Guys coming in off the street, running from the back. And Highland Park is an enormous church. Enormous. It's, it's been cut down now, but when, when it was, we were there, it sat 7,000 people on one floor. So it was arena-sized. And this guy comes hot footing it down the uh, down the, the the long aisle, so he could get saved. We had truckers pull up in the road, get out and come. You know, it, it just God will do something. People's lives get revolutionized. You know, you can see it, you can witness it. You know, something's going on. That's Paul's picture of repentance. Okay, so here's that is my definition. I call it test definition. Who knows? I might come up with something better. An act of the will. Okay, it's not just a feeling. You know, it's not just some intellectual. Oh, okay. I say I should probably do that. This is a, This is an act where my will says, "Hey, I have been going in a wrong direction. I'm going to make a 180 degree turn, and I'm going to go actively." In a right direction. So it transforms a repentant one's view of life, redirects his life and his service toward God. 1045, we're supposed to be done, right? It's only 1130 already, crying out loud. Sorry, church time. That's all, I'm just cutting in his sermon. Yeah, he'll be, he can he'll always cut his sermon short. So now we want to get to the important issue of kinds of repentance, because there are the word is used a number of ways in the Bible, and it never puts a flag on it. Just, you just see the word repentance. What does it mean? Okay, so we want to identify here the, the three most critical kinds of repentance. And the first one, of course, is repentance unto salvation. Okay, Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verse 10. Godly sorrow works repentance to salvation. Peter, in Acts chapter 2, repent and believe the gospel. And we, do, we say, conditions to salvation, repentance, and faith. That's pretty standard. You know? So this is that unsaved person recognizing by grace, remember, salvation is by grace, not by my skill or intellect, that there have been wrong in their thinking and they make that 180 degree turn and they suddenly realize there's only one God and there's only one Son of God, Jesus Christ and He's the one I ought to be trusting and serving. Okay, That's that repentance and faith that, that leads to salvation that Paul's talking about in that verse. So that is a repentance of an unbeliever. But there is another kind of repentance that unbelievers have and and in, in that same verse he call Paul calls it the sorrow of the world or the repentance of the world because let's face it 
Do we ever see unsaved folks make changes in their lives, do different things? Yeah. Sure we do. Um, but here it's the sorrow world. This, the, the, the difference is this means I'm sorry for the consequences of my actions on myself. Okay, I'm sorry for what this did to me. Hmm? I stuck my hand in an electrical socket. Wasn't a good move. You know. Um, so I'm, and I'm sorry about the consequences of that on me. That's that worldly sorrow that Paul says leads to death. Because as long as I am focused on myself, you know, oh, pity me. And maybe you have something to be pitied about. But repentance isn't looking at that. Okay? Repentance is looking at God. This is worldly repentance. And what does it, he say? It leads to death. It leads, in other words, you can't, if, if you're going to take the world's position, you're going to end up in the world's condition. Okay? <laughs> you know, Jesus is pretty clear that most of the world is headed to the wide gate that leads to destruction. And the gate to salvation is narrow. So when we look around us, we can't be surprised that the values we seem to hold don't seem to be shared by everybody. And every now and then, I'm like, if you're like me, I, you get very frustrated sometimes. You think, man, what are they doing? What are they saying? How can they possibly believe that? And we saw uh, certainly uh, some good examples during the last political stuff. People made incredible statements about other people. <clears throat> and, and it's because their perspective was worldly, was selfish. Okay? And, and when they were sorry about something, and of course now they're all weeping and moaning because they felt the wrong person got elected, right? Mm -hmm. But that sorrow is based on themselves. Oh, pity. I, you know, I, I said so-and-so was going to, I voted for so-and-so. Mm -hmm. yeah. For me, that's the world's sorrow. That's self-focused. Remember that, that uh, the origin or the basis of sin is selfishness. Whether you're talking about Eve, she saw this was cool, and I could, if I eat this, I'll get wise, and man, you know. Or, or, or even uh, Lucifer. You know? He said, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be like God. I'm so cool. I'm so beautiful. You know? Sound like some of the people in Hollywood, but anyway, you know. Well, but yeah. <laughs> well, they all. Say, well, that, the thing now that the question, yeah, another thing, and they all said, "Well, I'm leaving the country," yeah. but how many will? Because yeah. still, it's the greatest country in the world. Okay. Sorry, I've been there. I've been to other places. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. If you had to choose between India and America, you know. I might move to India not because of political. Cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's what hey, you'll be able to be what all the stars are. If they all, you know. Yeah, I'll start my mission still there. That's the reason I move it all. And so, you know, we live in a, in a world that's so focused on itself, and so if you get so much of this worldly repentance stuff. We have to be careful. We don't let our minds be confused about the meaning of the term. True. You know. Remember, we are, we are steeped in what's going on in the world. Yep. You know, we say, well, we got our churches. No, every church. Let's look at here. This church is right into in Corinth, to Corinth. You know, every mess up that Corinth was doing had found its way into the church. You know, there was division, there was immorality, there was ego. It was all in because we live in this world, and we cannot really shut out its influence, you know, uh, without forming some kind of a commune or something. And, and and Paul pretty clearly said, "Don't do that. You can't go out. You can't just leave the world and form a commune because then how are you going to reach them? You know, we have a burden to reach people. So repentance that leads one to save, and then there's that repentance that says, oh man.'" 
look at me, I, br I stubbed my toe, you know. I won't do that again. Oh, well, yeah, the other one, I got caught. I'm a robber. I got nothing against robbery, but boy, I don't want to spend time in prison. Yeah, I'm so sorry. You know? uh, and of course, you can see that that is a life orientation by so many of these people who do get caught. They go to prison, and they come out more accomplished criminals. Yep. You know, it's not like they, you know, some, now that sure some people do go to prison, get rehab, something, they change. But a whole lot of them come out worse than they went in. They call that rehabilitation. At, yeah. <laughs> well, if you're going to be a thief, you ought to be a sharp, professional thief. So, you know. So, anyway. And for that, we'll spend $100,000 for each of you for a year. Anyway. So, then the last one, of course, what we want to talk the most about in the next session or two is what I call believer's repentance. And again, because we think about repentance to salvation as a condition just to be, become a believer, we may think that's something that's only for lost people. Okay, it doesn't have a place. Well, I'm saved. Well, that repentance doesn't matter. Now I'm saved. But Paul pretty clearly here in, in 2 Corinthians 7 is talking to a church that's full of people as far as we know are saved. Okay? Again, remember back then you pretty much were saved. You were in church because there was a social, sometimes your own life was at stake. Sometimes your business, your relatives were at stake because they were all pagans. Okay, remember that everybody in, in Corinth, except within people in the church, they were all pagans. So it wasn't some kind of neutral. Sometimes here we have, we forget how easy you have because people aren't really anything in America. You know, they're not actively pagans, not actively anything. But these people are all pagans. So you think, okay, repented, that's, okay, I'm, I'm saved now, we're done with that. No, you're not, okay? Um, you know why? Because church has one tremendous problem I have found over the years. It's full of people. Yeah. You know? And, and the best of us are capable of doing the worst possible things. You know? There but for the grace of God. You know, we could all be on the front page of a newspaper or something horrible we did. Except for God's grace. And if that's true on that big of a scale, it's true on that smaller scale, too. Right? Um, now, if you remember 1 Corinthians and, and, and even the start of 2 Corinthians, Paul's relationship with Corinth was not good. I mean, 1 Corinthians, he just tore them up. Okay? And then he wrote them again, a letter that we don't have, by the way. Um, what we have is, by my count, is 2 Corinthians and 4 Corinthians. That's what we've got. That's what God chose, says, this is what you need to have. If, he, if we would have needed the other ones, he would have preserved them. He didn't. This is what we need. But anyway, so you had a tough relationship with a church. And so he's talking about a report that came back from uh, his guy, and uh, uh, Titus, whom he sent to the, back to the church to ch see what was cooking. And he got back a good report. Okay? He got a report that they were repentant. They were repenting. Um, so, now, so here we have a transformation in a believer's mind. Okay? If the basic meaning means to transform, to go 180 degrees different, that can happen in a believer's mind. Now, it doesn't mean you get unsaved and then get saved again. But it does mean that our lives are constantly tending to drift away from what God would have us to do. Right? And that great song, um, you know, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. I don't stop loving him, but I just, you know. And so there is a place for believers' repentance. Okay? Uh, we recognize personal failings. 
and take action. Okay, notice that little word, take action, to move ourselves back to a closer walk with God. That's what Paul says in 7 11. He says, Behold, the self same thing you sorrowed after a godly sort. You, you believers, you guys in the church, you made a change. Okay? Um, and this believer's repentance is, is critical for several reasons. First off, it indicates that there are backslidden believers. There are church groups and individuals today who believe that a Christian can achieve a state at which they are perfect, free from sin, uh, entire sanctification, the holiness churches. Any church that's got holiness in their name believes that in some, some level. And, and so they say, no, if, you, if you're really a Christian, you're not going to sin. Well, most of us who've got two eyes and a brain realize as we look around, we, you know, Christian people, you know, some of them mess up. Some of them mess up majorly. Some of them mess up in small ways. But there are backslidden Christians. That's what Paul is saying. He's talking to Christians and saying, you were going in the wrong direction, but you have made a change. You have changed your direction. <clears throat> By the way, it's, it's a, good, a good thing. Because if you ever work with people, and I've worked with I mean, so many churches, but if you work with people from one of those churches, they really suffer some terrible anxiety. Because they know they're not doing right. They're not perfect. And so they're not sure they're saved. You know, I've counseled more than a few of those folks. You know, show them passages and said, look, if we're saved, we're saved. We can't unsave ourselves, no matter what we do. God's got us. You know? But uh, th this, this passage is one you can go to because it said, look, here's a church full of believers. Some of them, they were messing up. They had to make a change. And that's hopeful for us, too, because we do mess up. You know, nobody here, of course, but Christian people do. And here's the thing. Hey, we can repent of that, just like these people did. We can repent, get back on the straight and narrow. Okay? Uh, and then, it, 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 by the way, the other thing about it is it's, it's visible. Repentance, we talked about that at the beginning. Repentance is an active verb. It produces results that are visible. Just like salvation. I have a question. Sure. How many times can you backslide? I think I backslid twice. I mean, you, seriously. Uh, a thousand times, a million times, 70 okay. times seven. Okay. I mean, really. So there's... when I stopped going to church when my husband died, I just blamed everybody. and. Yeah. Hey. I stopped going. You're a person. You have a problem, ma'am. You're a human. You have a serious problem. You're human. I think if we went around, we could all tell the same story. Yeah, story. yeah. You know, it, it happens. And, and we don't put a limit. It's not like, remember, that's why, that's why I think Jesus was talking to Peter. He said, look, 70 times 7, not 7 times. As many times as you need to. You know, see, if we said, I could only repent twice, then what we're saying is, that's how much mercy God has. He's only got two times mercy. Man, I hope he has more. I'm telling you, I hope he has a lot more than that. Just for me. We're not repenting in order to be saved again. No, this is saying, look, I'm not walking as I should be with God. I want to turn my direction around. Yeah. Next week we will, yeah, next week, we will get into, because Paul gives a marvelous analysis of what repentance is in this, in this passage. He gives seven characteristics. And, and they're, they're not really clear in English because English doesn't always have the right words to express what's going on. But uh, we'll go into that in detail the next week or maybe two, depending on how long each one of them takes to go through. But there's, you know, the characteristics are visible, okay? And, and where Paul says you have approved yourselves, that means you've shown. It's a demonstration. It's outward. It's visible. It doesn't necessarily require any particular spiritual discernment to see it. Someone who's an unbeliever can say, hey, you know, 
I remember when I got saved, people were going, whoa, what is up with these people? And some people reacted very negatively. One person, one lady was out to get me because I was Christian. How dare I sit there reading my Bible? You know, my lunch break. An athlete. So, and I got, so I got some flack. At least because they knew something was going on. You know, they could tell something had happened to me. And my demeanor, all that. So, um, again, um, so all these things are an outward recognition, something that's visible, something demonstrable, something you don't require spiritual discernment to see. This is out there. You've seen, I don't know, if you know people, you've seen that probably, where someone just was going in one direction, and all of a sudden, whoa, what happened to him, her, them, you know? There's the difference. I can, you know, I don't have to ask them what's cooking. I just can see how they're conducting themselves, and I recognize something is different about the person. Something's changed, okay? And that's what believer's repentance is all about. Okay? So, and you notice what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, 13. It says, therefore, we're comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because the spirit was refreshed for you all. Uh, you are my boasting, uh, his affection more toward you. I rejoice, therefore, in verse 16. And you compare those statements with what you heard in 1 Corinthians. What? Don't you have a single intelligent person among you? You know, who could do this? What? Why are you doing that? I need that more than once. What? What are you doing? You know? You idiots. He doesn't say idiots, but he could have from the way he talks. You know? <laughs> So it goes from that kind of approach to, man, I'm rejoicing. You guys are just bringing me joy. You're lifting me up. You're encouraging my soul. When I get this report of what you're doing, how you've repented, it's bringing me joy. You know? And he, didn't, he wasn't even there. He just got the report. But it was a clear enough report that he understood something genuine, repentance. And realize, again, realize that like salvation, like repentance and salvation, it's grace. You know, none of us could really repent except God helps us. But he does help us. You see, you know, he says, I'm not down. my grace is with you. My Holy Spirit's living in you. Nudging you in the right direction. So when we are able to exercise that believer's repentance, we know it's from God. It's not just some special ability we've got. It's God's special grace working with us. And he helps us to do it. And the results are great. And we will discuss all those kinds of results next week. And maybe two weeks. It just depends how long it's going to take me to get through them. Any questions? Very good. Yes, you all need to repent. And that's the answer for that. <laughs> uh. Alrighty. That's about right. Yes, we'll look at that. Within a minute. I mean, come on. I mean, just because I've been teaching for over 40 years, 